We're excited to have one of our colleagues in the Department of Psychology, uh, Dr. Sam Hardy, who's an Associate Professor of Psychology. Uh, uh, Dr. Hardy received his PhD in 2005 in developmental psychology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he also did a master's degree and before that, a bachelor's in family sciences with human development emphasis uh, right here at BYU. Uh, his research, as we will learn shortly, focuses, among other things, on religious and spiritual development across adolescence and young adulthood, uh, including processes and trajectories of religious and spiritual development. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Development and Health Research Methodology in the Department of Psychology at University of Virginia. He's an associate editor for the Journal of Research on Adolescence and uh, editorial board member of Journals of Developmental Psychology, Journal of Research on Adolescence, Journal of Moral Education, and Journal of Youth and Adolescence, just to give you kind of a sense of the span of his work. Um, and. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Hardy here, and he's also one of my uh, collaborators and, and co-authors on a couple of papers now, one that we have in press coming out soon. So we're excited to hear from you and uh, have a conversation around your work. So uh, just so everybody knows, if you're kind of new here, we basically go until about 5.20, um, and we'll give Dr. Hardy as long as he wants, typically around 40, 50 minutes to present, and we'll have kind of a Q&A after. So uh, feel free at the end to... Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, get your questions ready and we'll take those either via chat if you're in a place where you can't talk or uh, sort of the digital hand raising. So join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hardy to present to us today. Virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, hey, um, I'm coming to you from Spanish Fork, Utah. <laughs> and because of that, uh, maybe two caveats or whatever, warnings. Um, my computer, I need a new computer and I don't get a new one for about four or five months. And this one sometimes just dies randomly in the middle of Zoom. Let me actually close out a couple more things. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so if it- If, if, if it, it dies, I'll stall for time and we'll wait until you come back. Yeah, if I'm talking and it totally blacks out, I'll be back in like 10 minutes. Um, and then I'm at home with the kids and dog. I put the dog away. So you might hear loud music, some other stuff, maybe some fighting, you know, it's all part of the ambiance of the talk. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've known Jacob for a while and we've done stuff together. Um, and as far as updates to my bio, I'm full professor now and I'm not on any of those journals anymore. <laughs> I, I, I finished my tenure at those journals. Uh, so I was going off your current CV on the uh, website, and actually, I have to say, I, I, I was on the uh, rank and status committee, and I couldn't remember. It's all a fog now. Whether that was this year we read your file or last year, yeah. so my bad. Yeah, Poor professor. I, I, probably last fall. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I need to update my CV, at least the one that's posted. So uh, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff on moral development, identity formation. Um, most of the stuff I've done with Jacob is on moral, moral development, moral psychology. Now I'm focusing a lot on religious spiritual development. And I figured just for this talk, um, focus on religious identification, just because I've had some papers recently on that and forthcoming papers on that. And I uh, thought that might be of interest to anthropologists. So, Let me, let's see, what's the easiest way to do this? Okay. Uh, you can see that, right? Yep. Let me see how this goes. Okay. Okay, so first of all, uh, definitions. So basically by the word or the phrase religious identification, I mean, what people say when you ask them what religion they are or you know questions like that uh so surveys will have questions single item questions like this like which religion do you most closely identify with which of the following best describes you that kind of thing and they might have like you know a handful of options 
like some that I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, sociologists, if they have surveys, they might get a little more sophisticated, particularly if the emphasis is on religion. And so they might have a series of um, skip patterns or whatever, like a hierarchy of questions. So it's, are you religious? If they say yes, then, you know, major traditions. And if they pick, you know, Christianity, then they drill down, drill down, drill down. And so there could be potentially like hundreds of options that uh, end up in the data. Um, so why not call it religious affiliation? That's what I call it a lot of times, but religious affiliation sounds like um, a categorical variable for all the people who are religious. So religious identification sounds better in the sense of like capturing religious affiliations and like non-affiliated people. Uh, but yeah, there's synonyms. Um, so varieties of religious identification. So here's, you know, different categories you might have, right? Uh, depending on the survey and what people are doing, but these are some of the major possibilities. Uh, so the NSYR, which I'll talk about more, it's the sociological data set. I'll show you some of their major categories and they actually pull out Latter-day Saints um, when they do some of their analyses, but not some of these other groups, um, just because they're kind of one of the larger of the other categories. And they also tend to be pretty unique in terms of relations to outcomes and stuff like that. Sometimes people might lump Protestant altogether, but the NSYR breaks it out into these four categories. At the least, evangelical or conservative tend to be different than mainline. Um, so anyway, that's what I mean by religious identification. So uh, there's a lot of aspects of religiousness that you can study. Um, and religious identification uh, is like one of them. And this is a typology or whatever you want to call it, not, um, list of dimensions that we put in this paper that got published a year or so ago. Um, honestly, I kind of like wasn't 100% sure about it. And there's a few things that I would do different just depending. So sometimes I would look at like religious identity as maybe going into the affective because it has to do with how important religion is. And then affiliation might be something totally different. So, but anyway, so religious identification or here it's like affiliation under identification is like one piece of the puzzle of what religiousness might mean. Uh, so what does it capture? So this is the item, or these are the items. So it's basically usually one item or like a drill down of items. But in the end, you get one answer. This is what religious identification you are. Uh, but what does that really capture? So it's more complicated than I originally thought. So a few years ago, I got invited to write a chapter on disaffiliation or non-affiliation or whatever you want to call it, non-religiousness for a book that's cited here on the corner and it's still forthcoming. And I wrote from like a developmental psych perspective of why people leave religion in adolescence and young adulthood. Um, and so this was kind of a cool opportunity because it was a multidisciplinary book where there was people from a lot of different disciplines. And we had like a little shindig before writing the book and said, hey, this is what I want to write my chapter about at USC back when we could meet places and travel. Um, and then we had a year to write the chapter and then we met again, said, hey, here's what my chapter is about. Everybody read each other's chapters. And that really opened up my eyes to how complicated religious identification is. Um, like you might think, oh, there's sometimes we talk about nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that's like people who have no religious affiliation as being one category, but there's a lot of variety there even as far as atheist, agnostic, just people who don't want to say what religion they are, or any religion, but they don't really have any strong feelings about it. Um, so it's pretty complicated, but additionally, there's some chapters in this book where 
it's like if you compare religious and non-religious people, sometimes non-religious people are more religious. Sometimes people who say they aren't religious are more religious on some of these other dimensions here in my slides uh, than people who say they are religious and maybe like identify with Catholic or Protestant or Latter-day Saint. So it's just kind of weird. It's like, what really goes into this? Like there's, it's not, 100% distinct. It's kind of like cross-cultural stuff where there's overlapping distributions. So if you have people who identify as religious, people who identify as not religious, there's still some overlap in terms of beliefs, involvement, uh, stuff like that, that, that make it really kind of, like I said, more complicated than it would seem. And then, uh, you know, my typology, I put religious affiliation with religious identity because both kind of have to do with how you see yourself. And in fact, the terms get um, confused a lot. So a lot of times um, when people use the word religious identification or religious affiliation, all they mean is that you are religious. They might not look at specific religions. They're just like, are you religious or are you not religious? Uh, and then, you know, so religious identity, religiousness uh, is like, you know, how religious you are, beliefs, behaviors, importance, identification. So, so if you look at um, the word religious identity, the phrase religious identity, uh, here's, what the, here's what it should be. So the, the phrase religious identity can be basically synonymous with, with religious identification. So some studies, if you look at it, it says like the variable is religious identity, but really they're just looking at if somebody says they're religious. Sometimes the word re phrase religious identity means like just overall religiousness. There's a lot of qualitative studies that use the phrase religious identity. And it's just really something about how people talk about their religion. And then there's some studies that actually do like use kind of like an identity formation way of measuring quantitatively religious identity from a kind of a, an identity theory um, perspective. So anyway, what I mean by this slide is that sometimes people use the word religious identi identity to mean religious identification like what I'm saying is religious identification or religious affiliation. So you have to just be careful when they're using terms, like what do they really mean? Are they just really, is it, are they using it as a synonym of identification and affiliation or do they you mean religious identity as something else? Okay, so stability and change in religious identification. So first of all, it depends on the context. So it, see, it would seem like somebody's religious identification kind of is what it is, but really it's, this is another thing I learned at that, at those shindigs down at USC with all the people in all these other disciplines who spend more time studying religious nuns and stuff like that than I do. Um, but really it's just an answer to a question. <laughs> so that's really all it is. And I can change my answer to a question anytime I want. So if somebody asks me, hey, what religion you are, it might depend on who's asking. It might depend on how they're asking the question, like the instructions, the options that are given, um, how they set up the skip patterns, if it's multiple questions, what kind of mood I'm in. Like maybe I'm upset at my religion and so I'm not gonna claim it that day. Um, uh, so some of it's kind of fickle in that sense, right? Uh, but also it changes by individual development. So I'll show data later from on adolescence. So adolescents might shift in the sense of like leaving religion or joining, like maybe they're religious and then they switch to being not religious or maybe they're not religious and they switch to being religious or maybe they shift from one religion to another. Uh, so there's these different transitions that might happen that frequently happen in adolescence and young adulthood. Those are kind of the hot periods of time where it might be more most likely to happen. Um, and then there's a phrase that you might see in some places called like liminal, which kind of means like a lukewarm member of a religious group. So I might say that I'm Catholic, but I really never go to church and do anything that has to do with Catholicism. 
And so that's kind of like, maybe those people, sometimes they're asked, they'll say they're Catholic. Sometimes they're asked, they'll say they're not religious. Uh, so anyway, and then there's also shifts across history where the reason why they had us put write this book is because a uh, kind of alarming historical trend in the sense of like, it's a pretty noticeable trend is that a lot more people are leaving religion, his historic rates, you might say in the last few decades. So the percent of people in the US who don't identify with a religion is going up and up and up and up, particularly among the, like I said, young adults, adolescents, young adults. So there's kind of a developmental movement, adolescence and young adulthood that, that people move away from religion developmentally. There's also his, a historical movement away from religion. Okay, so here's some data on the trends. So most data on religious identification in terms of just like cross-sectional or like historical trends is with adults in the US. So it's really hard to get data on religious identification in other countries. And it's really hard to get data on religious identification among teens. That's like representative. Um, so here's some data on adults, uh, just to kind of show you the extent of non-religiousness or uh, stuff like that and how it might change over time. Uh, the uh, Pew Research Center is a major source of this data and information. And this is summarized, some of this info is summarized in my chapter that's going into that book. Uh, okay, so then since, since there isn't the data that I want on teens, uh, in a chapter, I don't think I'm I have this chapter cited here. I, I didn't really have time, but I'm finishing up a chapter for an APA handbook on adolescent young adult development that's just a kind of an overall chapter on religious development in adolescents and young adulthood. And so where we review this stuff in that chapter, we actually report this data that's, that's right here because this data is not reported anywhere else. Even though people have published a lot using this data set that I'll talk more about, the NSYR, they've never published it the way that I wanted to slice it up. So this shows you using this data set that's getting a little old now, but it's a nationally representative data set of uh, 3,000, about 3,000 families um, and teens. So this shows percents developmentally and you can kind of see how things shift over time. So percent Protestants going down, percent Catholics going down, others fairly stable and nuns going up. And then here's just some data on number of switches. And I know this doesn't add up to 100%, but that's because some people are counted in more than one of these bullets here as far as number of switches. So as you can see, it's much more common to leave religion than it is to join religion in adolescence. Like trends towards religion are, are the exception. <laughs> uh, and then there's a lot of people that change or, or stay the same, either they always are religious or they're always not religious. They're the, so they're not experiencing a shift. Okay, and then here's like Pew just barely collected a data set like all their adult data sets, but a teen data set about a year ago. So they're, they're just now pushing out reports online that you can find about, about teens. I think it's like, so the NSYR is nationally representative and it's about 3000. Um, Pew is nationally representative and I think it's a little under 2000. Um, and most of the Pew stuff's cross-sectional. I don't think they ever intended it to be longitudinal, whereas the NSYR was four waves longitudinal. So if you pull out the Pew and compare it to the NSYR, which is you know, almost 20 years old now for these ages, you can kind of say that this might be kind of like a historical trend because presumably they both did a pretty decent job of getting nationally representative. So you can see uh, the percent that's uh, Protestant Catholics, well, at least the percent Protestants going down, Catholic looks like it's about the same. 
and the nuns are higher in their data set, which is about like 15 years newer. So my guess is the historical trends just kind of continuing probably fairly linear. Uh, okay, so here's research questions that I have and I'll show you a little bit of data and then some of it's kind of still forthcoming or in progress. So what are predictors of religious transitions? Particularly, I'm interested in deconversion since that's kind of the hot topic is people leaving religion. What are outcomes of, re of religious identification transitions, particularly deconversion? So when people leave religion, what, what's the effect of that on their life? And then how and why do youth uh, outcomes vary across religious identification. So a little bit interested in that because that's something that the NSYR people talked about a lot. In particular, they talk about like stuff that was interesting to me was that they, um, even though like it's nationally representative, so there's not that many Latter-day Saint families in there. So it's like two to 3%. So whatever that was, you know, less than a hundred families that are Latter-day Saint. But in all of their books and stuff, generally speaking, Latter-day Saint teens come out on top as far as like most religious, most adaptive, sometimes um, conservative uh, evangelical Protestant teens are also kind of up there, are, are up there on par equal sometimes and, and black Protestant teens as well. So there are certain affiliations that tend to do better and, than others and those are some. And so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm interested in unpacking that and understanding a little more about why and maybe replicating it with other data sets that where there's more than, you know, whatever, several dozen LDS families. Okay, so predictors of uh, deconversion. So most of the research, so this is what I reviewed a lot in this paper, this chapter. Uh, and it's a pretty good chapter. I spent, I put a lot of work into it. It was one of the hardest things I've written because most of my research is on religious development, not religious undevelopment. So I had to kind of explore that new area. So most of the research on why people leave religion, at least in adolescence, young adulthood is, is retrospective qualitative kind of research. So they find people who have left religion and they ask them why. And so um, you know, I'm a, I used to be a Dave Letterman fan, so this is my top 10. So the top 10 reasons for leaving religion, uh, this is kind of taken across, you know, whatever, a half dozen, a dozen books and chapters and articles where they do this kind of thing. Um, and some of them are more academic, like the NSYR. Some of them are kind of pseudo-academic in the sense that it's like somebody that is with a religious group collects some data and, and does some data analysis and reports it, but it's not necessarily coming out of a, a university. Um, and some of it has to do with maybe specific affiliations, like there's one book on why kids leave Seventh-day Adventist religion and stuff like that. Okay, so here they are, uh, some of the top reasons, and you can kind of see some themes in here. And I, I'm really interested in a psychological theory called self-determination theory. So in this chapter, I talk about how you can kind of look at these reasons from that lens um, in the sense of basically people aren't feeling accepted by their religious community. Uh, kids aren't feeling accepted. They aren't feeling like they're given autonomy and like an active role. And so that might be why they're feeling disenfranchised or whatever and want to, to disengage or leave their religion. Okay, but not that many people have actually like pr prospectively predicted why people leave religion. So using longitudinal data, quantitative data, stuff like that. So that's what's in process for me. Um, there is some prior research on, on predictors. Uh, you know, here's some kinds of things, you know, males are more likely to leave religion. Catholics are more likely to leave, yada, yada. Um, <laughs> Education, it depends on which study you look at. Sometimes like people with more education are more likely to leave. Sometimes studies show people with less education are more likely to leave. Uh, I don't know, depends on which paper you read. But these kind of things, you know, if they have family members who have left, if their parents aren't really as religious or don't emphasize as much kind of more permissive parenting style of religious parenting, 
they struggle a lot. These are the people that are more likely to leave. But this generally hasn't been so much done with like longitudinal research that's predicting it. So this is what we're trying to do. So we have the NSYR data set. So here's some more description on that. Um, so a sociological data set, uh, nationally represented 3000 plus. They have qualitative data interview, extensive qualitative interviews on about 300 of the families. Uh, so that's recorded in a lot of their books, really cool data there that uh, you, know, you guys might be more interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was four waves. I don't know how many waves they did the qualitative interviews, not sure on that. And then, uh, so anyway, so we're using, some of my students and I are using, we just barely got some of this data from our friend, uh, Philip Schwedel. And uh, so we're gonna look at some variables that they have in this data set that kind of get at these kinds of things. You know, how accepted they feel in their religious community, how engaged they feel by their religious community, that kind of thing. And whether that predicts across the four waves which kids are, are leaving religion. And then uh, I also have a data set I'll talk about a little bit more that's uh, with some people at BYU. That is, so, so since there's only like if not that many Latter-day Saint families in this data set, with some people in the religion department at BYU here, uh, we're collecting data where it's about 50% LDS and, and then the rest other affiliations. And so kind of trying to replicate some of the same stuff with, with that data set. Uh, anyway, we're also looking at, generally speaking, why teens get less religious across adolescence. Um, so certain factors that might predict that. So predict decline, predict leaving. And then if there's a link between leaving and decline, so there's not a whole lot of research on that, this either. It's kind of speculation that uh, basically you get less religious and then at some point you're like, ah, what the heck? And you just abandon ship rather than you're really religious and just one day you decide to leave. That might happen for some people, but probably it's like get less religious, then you're like liminal. And then you just kind of, there's kind of some kind of tipping a point. Like if you think of the Latter-day Saint church, you could think, okay, maybe somebody's fizzling in, 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 in our church. And then the church leaders make some statement that has some political uh, ramifications and it just ticks them off and they're like, yeah, whatever, I'm done. That's probably happened to a lot of people. Something about, you know, gay marriage or something like that. Some hot political issue. Uh, that will offend, will offend somebody. So, so, so I want to look at how that's related. Does that make sense? Like declines in religiousness and how there's maybe like a tipping point of something that either something the church does, something maybe their family does, maybe their local church leader does, maybe just like a stressful life event that kind of puts them over the edge. Okay. Oh yeah, here's the, the one, the other one that I'm talking about. This is the one at BYU. Family foundations with these three guys and, and, and their religion professors here. And so this is our data set and uh, we're doing some of, some of the things that I mentioned as well as we're trying to get approval to hand pick people from this data set that have specific characteristics and do qualitative research on them. So we could pick LDS youth who leave the church and try to understand better why. Uh, there's some books coming out recently uh, in the last year or two about that, but more from like, so there's a book, um, uh, Next Mormon, it's really cool, Next Mormon, um, and that's more young adults, like, and cross-sectional research on why they leave, so we would, this would be the, probably one of the first is looking at adolescents that are LDS who leave, and, and, and we'll have all this other quantitative data on them as well. So that'll be an interesting mixed methods way of looking at that. Okay, so that's predictors. And then outcomes, uh, I'm, I'm uh, collaborating with some social psychologists and Philip Schwedel, that sociologist. And so they have, the social psychologists have this religious residue idea. 
And that's the idea that when people leave religion, even though now their current state is that they say they're not religious, they're not the same as the other people that are not religious because they were religious. And so there's something that's kind of lingering. And I found this really cool quote in a book called Mass Exodus, it's kind of a clever name, but it's a book uh, about why people leave the Catholic church. And this quote was in that book. It's not, it's from another author, another book, but it was, I found it in that book. And so it just kind of shows you that like being an ex something is an identity. So if you leave the Latter-day Saint church, you're an ex Mormon or whatever, that's an actual identity. And it's different from somebody who grew up not religious. And so we're trying to understand like to demonstrate that. So we have two papers, one that's accepted for, pub for publication and one that's under review. So here's the one that's accepted. And so they, the social psychologists had their, a couple of data sets of their own that get, went into this paper. And then Philip and I used the NSYR. And so we classified people in, in, according to religious duns. So people who left religion and nuns. And we're comparing them on heights, moral foundations. So this is kind of a measure of how people think about morality, like what's right and wrong. And so, so these are the five foundations so uh, morality is about whether you're harming or helping people, fairness. These are like really big things in psychology that are studied a lot. And so, so some of the height people call these individualizing because they're more kind of about like individual relationships. And this is like more a group dynamic kind of stuff, the binding. So in group favoritism, authority, like respect for authority and then purity, kind of chastity kind of stuff, right? Okay, so we expect we expected some kind of stair step pattern that you would have like the religious people that would be really high on some of these, the nuns who would be really low on them, and then the duns that would be in between. So here's some figures from that paper. So these two individualizing ones over here, you can see there's not a whole lot of difference. So people who are not religious, which you know, you might think like political ideology is kind of linked in with religiousness and generally liberal people who are more liberal oriented tend to be really high on some of these individualizing and not so much on the other ones. Uh, so there's less differentiation there. Like everybody thinks that these are important. But the other ones, there is differentiation and you can kind of see for some of these, for these two right here, the stair stepper thing that we were looking for. So the religious people, the people who have always been religious, at least for the waves that we have, um, the highest, the people who have always not been religious, uh, um, the lowest, and then the duns in between. So the people when they left, so either maybe the duns were always kind of lukewarm on their moral foundations, or, or they are hanging on to it. So the whole thing about, you know, chicken, egg, morality versus religious affiliation, like um, what causes what, that's what the reviewers ask. So we did some analyses. I don't have them in these slides. We don't, we only have the moral foundations at the last wave. That's kind of the downer of this. So we couldn't do that kind of um, cross-lagged uh, bi-directional relationship kind of analyses with the moral foundations, but we had another measure of a moral attitude belief and we found bi-directional relations. Uh, so it's probably that, you know, there's some dynamic link between changes in morality and changes in religion. And it's, it's shown here in this stair stepper thing. Here's another way of looking at it where we said, okay, maybe can we break it out by like when they were done? So what wave they left? And you can kind of see like the longer they've left, because remember the moral foundations outcome is wave four. So if they left religion in wave two, they weren't as di that different from the people who were never religious because they've had several years to be not religious. The people who left just barely, right? They're still like closer to the religious people. So some of these, we don't see that much of that but like some, like this one down here, purity, that seems pretty, a pretty, you know, you get a pretty nice slope there of like how long you've been away from religion 
shows how your moral foundations are. Okay, and then the next one that we're working on now is with Schwartz universal values. So Schwartz, this guy Schwartz, he has this universal circumflex model of values. And this looks similar, probably for a reason that there's something in the world that it looks like this, that you have these uh, individualizing sorts of concerns and then these binding sorts of concerns. Over here, you got kind of the personal focus and the social focus. I'm not sure if that's a perfect match, but there's something there that's similar and the results are based or similar as well. So, okay, so uh, here's what that, if you look up any Schwartz article, it'll have his model like this. So here's all those values and like values that are across from other values are the most different or opposite. And then here's like some higher order dimensions and then really the big two is like personal versus social. And by the way, none of Schwartz figures in his papers were that good. So my wife made this and it's totally better. And so this is what's going in our paper, uh, our improvement on Schwartz's circumflex model. She, she knows how to use graphic software. So she made me a sweet figure. Okay. So here's how this maps out. So uh, some of these, you can see differences. So here's affiliate heat. So this one Phillips in charge of, and he broke them up a little different. So he added what he's calling sacralized. I don't know really what that word means, but that's his people that converted to religion. So you got the people who have always been religious, the nuns, the duns, and the people who converted. And so you can compare them on some of these values, right? And so some of these you can see the stair stepper, like these ones right here, you can see. So these ones are over here, some of these social focused ones, right? Uh, that's where you see them. These ones right here. Um, not so much in these more universal kind of ones. And then not so much in this, uh, I didn't have a nice title heading for this, but these are the person. So the first figure, these are the social, and then this is, these are the personal values. So the most stair stepper is for these three that are right here in this model. So these three right here show the stair stepper where uh, nuns are the lowest, religious people, whether they've converted or always been religious are highest, and then the duns are in between. Okay. All right, and then in progress, uh, you know, some of my colleagues and one of my students are working on qualitative research where they're studying, I think mostly what they're going to focus on are reconvert reconverts. So you got people who deconvert and then reconvert and they want to study them qualitatively. So these guys are like top notch qualitative researchers here at BYU. And then this is an undergrad who's working with them and he's applying to grad school to work with them. And so they're going to also look at the role of like reconverting on family relationships and maybe deconverting as part of that. Like how did deconverting affect your family relationships? How did reconverting affect your family relationship? Ironically, so, uh, well, I don't know how ironic it is, but it's like really interesting that family and developmental psychology is usually seen as a context. So there's a lot of research on the family context of religious development, like how family affects religious development. There's not hardly any research on how religious development affects family relationships. And then here's just some other you know, I can use the NSYR and the foundations to look at outcomes of, of deconversion, um, some other kinds of outcomes, right? Uh, comparisons. So this is my last research question. So comparisons. So uh, most religious dimensions vary across religious identification. So most aspects of religion, you'll see some variability across religious identification. A lot of youth outcomes you'll see um, variation across religious identification. Generally, people who are kids who are religious are better off than kids who are not religious. 
like they're more religious than people who are not religious that makes sense obviously and they're and they're also um better off on a lot of the outcomes maybe not all of them and then in terms of specific religious affiliations like i said earlier lds conservative evangelical protestant black protestant tend to be the best mainline protestant catholic jewish tend to be kind of the least adaptive least religious of the religious teams and sometimes catholic and jewish teams actually aren't different from non-religious teams on some variables this is all based on the nsyr okay but it's been validated by some other studies okay so here's some of my own data so uh, I collected, this is not nationally representative, but it is teens from across the country using a survey panel. And so it's somewhat smaller cross-sectional sample. And this is basically like, I was interested in how kids think about sex and alcohol, like the morality of sex and alcohol. So one question is basically about how much they think it's a moral issue, like is having sex a moral or ethical issue? Is drinking alcohol as a teen a moral issue? And this other one is like how they think about it. Is it a personal issue? It's like up to you. Hey, whatever you do, if whatever you want. Is it a social issue? Hey, if there's a law against it, then it's bad. If there's not a law against it, who cares? Or is it a moral issue? Yeah, it's wrong no matter what. Uh, so we wanted to look at that. I have some data comparing affiliations in, in, in this data set. And so this is if you look LD, the Latter-day Saint teens are the highest on both of those measures for both of the um, behaviors. So basically, Latter-day Saint teens most likely to think that it's a moral issue, teens having sex and drinking alcohol, and either way with either of those variables. And then here's chi-squares to kind of show in terms of like the moral judgment, like how, how they thought about it. So Latter-day Saint teens are the most likely to think that sex, that teens having sex is a moral issue. See the highest percentage. And then they're also the most likely to think that teens drinking alcohol is a moral issue. So the other affiliations were more likely to think it's like a social issue or maybe a personal issue. Okay, then some longitudinal data. So this is from the NSYR. And so just, there's a lot of numbers. I just barely put these in. That's why they don't look that good like an hour ago. Uh, so hot off the press. Um, and some of this you'll find in their books, but we're trying to unpack it a little more with future analyses. So basic trends I'll just talk to you about, like you can kind of see like LDS teams, not bad on purpose, not bad on grades. Like they're kind of in the middle, right? Um, kind of at the upper end on involvement here and upper end on, uh, I guess, somewhat in the, in the middle upper end on pro-social. But then if you look at sex, the lowest on sex, this is behaviors, these are outcomes. So sex is like how much they've had sex. So the lowest on that, how much they've used alcohol, lowest on that, uh, cheating in school, lowest on that, and depression, lowest on that. So I guess, I mean, if you're making it, <laughs> Uh, any implications off of this, even though the the LDS percent is really small in this data set. Um, we're really good at getting our kids not to do bad things, but we could we could do a little work on getting them to do more good things. Um, uh, you know, just looking at these numbers. So what we're trying to do, uh, I'm also get so one of the ways to address the issue I said there's not that many LDS families that are representing these numbers. The foundation's data set is almost 50% LDS, so it's definitely like a huge oversample. Can we find a lot of the same trends if we then have like a flip-flop where like most of the teens are LDS and there's some comparisons? We're gonna find the same kind of trends. Still working on that. And then we wanna look at moderators. Why are there these differences? And so we fiddled around with this because we're putting out some uh, conference proposal abstracts or whatever to, to present in conferences in the spring virtually. Uh, and so generally the trend, like it's not always holding, but let's say like right here, right? So the LDS teens are, are the least involved in these risk behaviors. So if we account for like religious attendance, importance, that kind of thing, does that make a difference? 
Well, generally, LDS teens are also attending church more, and it's more important to them. So when we account for that, this difference will drop a little bit in the statistics, maybe a lot. So we're looking at the idea that the kids who are doing better on these outcomes are probably the kids who are in religions where those teens are more actively religious, active religiously. So they're going to church more, they're more engaged, they see their religion as more important. So since LDS teens are more religious and religion is related to sex and alcohol, it makes sense that they would be the teens that would be the lowest on that. So we're kind of actually, we're just trying to do stats on that. Okay, so conclusions. Religious identification is an important but complex dimension of religion. Across adolescence and across history, people are becoming less religious. We know retrospectively why people leave religion, but not much about prospectively predicting what actually predicts when they who will leave. When people make a shift, uh, stuff seems to linger. And religious outcomes vary across religion, but we don't know that much about why, like how and why. Uh, so some of the general trends, you know, uh, that I showed are, are replicated across studies. We're trying to replicate the LDS factor about how those teens are doing really well in a study that has a higher percent LDS. And then we're trying to unpack the why. So that's it. I'll stop sharing. Let me know what questions you have.